famed author Clive Cussler. The hero Dirk Pitt. I suggest you show respect for the office of the president. Gosh, Rudy, I'm flattered all to hell. The president greeted Pitt courteously and held out his hand. Pitt gave him an amused look. You're gay, you're wasting your time. Night Probe, Episode 6, Cup Dumped. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff where the basic medical advice is, uh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll see what happens in a couple of weeks. Like, my doctor told me to my face, it'll either get better or it won't. When we were talking, I don't even remember what the hell that was about. That wasn't my neck, that was something else. But yeah, you just told me, well, it'll either get better or it won't, because he's Irish. <laughs> oh, so it sounds lyrical and irritating. <laughs> yep. Hey, Lily. The podcast is here. <laughs> and, and then one day I, f I phoned in to make an appointment and found out my doctor had moved back to Ireland. Oh, that's good. A few months ago, I called to my doctor was like, you need this prescription, but it's a controlled substance. So call back on this date and I'll just call it in because that's the soonest you can have it. And I called him to call it in and he had died. My Whoa. doctor had <laughs> died. <laughs> That's not a good advertisement for the uh, medical industry. And I was like, oh, I need this medicine. <laughs> oh, I have my daughter turn 16, so she wants a learner's permit. Ooh. I thought this would be straightforward. Not, she passed the learner's permit test online, which I was disappointed it was online. In my day, you had to go and <laughs> fill it out. I was like, it's on, you don't even have to go. But now I have to show up to the DMV and prove that she's a person in my day my mom went with her driver's license and said this is my daughter and that was it it's all that was needed yeah mine too now i, I need, need to come up with seven seven points none of my identification counts i can't prove i went to the i lost your social security card so i go to the social security card office and i'm i've got her birth certificate i've got you know the receipt the baby receipt with the footprints on it i'm like no <laughs> one else would have this but no her school had to print her a special id I have to take her to the district. Like, I'm just trying to prove you're a person that's real. But in the meantime, hunting for all those documents, I have found so many of my dead relatives' hair. <laughs> Apparently, you just save... It was an Irish tradition, maybe, to save a lock of hair. So I've got a lot of old people I've never met. I've got vestiges of them. I only have my mom and my dad's. But then again, maybe they had versions of... They had locks of hair from relatives I've never met. You might have a box in your attic or something. Oh God! <laughs> that's just waiting for you. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a very serious marital question. Very serious. Uh oh. You have brought three children to the world. It's a very serious thing. You created life. They're a little older now. Do you keep the baby teeth? What do you do with the baby teeth? Am I honor bound to keep <laughs> the baby teeth forever? I don't know. I know we have a couple of baby teeth still. I know we have a bunch of our youngest baby teeth. Because I might have actually mentioned this before, uh, when he was one and a half, he had to go under for full dental surgery. He is he had basically rotted out his baby teeth because he would only go to bed with a bottle of milk or a bottle of juice, not water. And if it wasn't milk or juice, wouldn't fucking go to bed. What are you going to do? The kid has to sleep. Yeah, but you can't rot out. He's the, he's the third kid, the number three, right? Yeah. <laughs> the latest model. You have given up at that point, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, kind of. <laughs> but if you rot out the baby teeth, that can rot out the adult teeth and they can yes, rot out your sure. jaw. So he had to go under for surgery. So at like the age of one and a half had like eight metal cap teeth. So when those came out, we, uh, those were the baby bionic teeth. We had to keep those. Well, the, yeah, you've <laughs> got to keep like the jaws teeth. Yeah. So I know we still have some of those around here somewhere. Why now? Why? <laughs> Listeners, the cat is trying to... <laughs> Get into Topper's mouth? <laughs> Ignored me all morning. Went oh, just hauling ass. Got a cat. About half an hour ago, went hauling her ass around the entire living room, just like seeing ghosts, doing backflips, jumping off the furniture. <laughs> and now is trying to get inside my shirt. <sighs> anyway. Oh, and our town mayor was arrested again. <laughs> yeah, hey, local politics. What? 
they say isn't true about me. It's a left-wing media conspiracy. My middle name is allegedly. There's nothing sticks to me. That guy is a local politician. <laughs> local politician. Is customary? Like every... This guy, this is the second time this guy has been arrested. I don't know if they have this archaic form of uh, document authorization in Canada because it's, I feel like I'm about to explain a feudal system of grain counting. Do you know what a notary public is? Yes. It creates, a, you, the person has a raised seal and they witness the document, usually a document being signed and they apply their seal and their signature and it makes the document more legally weighty. Yeah, we've had to go through a whole bunch of that the last couple of years. The whole underpinning of society rests on this and not the concurrent understanding that you could also just buy that piece of machinery, the press, with whatever you wanted to say off of eBay <laughs> or Amazon. I have one. It says, this is not a notary stamp. It's a race stamp, not a notary stamp. I have used that every time I've needed a notary stamp. Nothing has ever come. Nothing. Ooh. Nobody checks it. <laughs> and it's not against the law because it says on the stamp, this is not a notary stamp. I am not lying. <laughs> That's basically the equivalent to wearing a black and white striped shirt that says I'm not a referee on it. Yes. Yes. But I use it for things like... And just wandering onto the sports field. <laughs> I used it for things like getting a permit to repair my fence. The fence is already there. I'm just not going to go mm. to... We don't need to bring the law into this. I'm just getting a permit. Back when I was an RBD, a registered building designer, boy, would I have loved the ability to get the stamp uh, for permits like that. Because the whole point of, of being an RBD, I didn't have a stamp, but I was authorized to do drawings. As long as it's zone residential, I can do light commercial up to 4,000 square feet. I can do a whole bunch of stuff without having to stamp it. And then you had to wait 12 weeks to get a stamp from a mechanical engineer on a drawing to install an especially large range hood, perhaps. Oh, so something just very irritating <laughs> and not structural. But that has to go through the city, and that has to get reviewed, and that has to go through the process, and the process takes for fucking ever. Well, this guy was using his... Which is why so much stuff gets done without permits. His notary stamp. Good and bad. And his friend's assorted collection of notary stamps to that was the underpinning of their paperwork to remortgage their houses through the county for values that are 10 to 18 times more than the house hmm. so as far as i know my town is out of money <laughs> i'm learning so much from you <laughs> but if ever if everyone is in on the act mutually assured destruction until it crumbles i think it crumbled that is my understanding of macroeconomics that's really grim very funny, <laughs> but very grim. We could just do whatever we want if we have a stamp. It's the civil equivalent of I can do whatever I want as long as I have a gun. I could say I'm a god. <laughs> I've got a form that says I do. It's stamped. God told me this. Give me your stuff. Your wife and my husband. <laughs> Boy, do they have to get together. <laughs> Listeners, the topper very graciously rescheduled this session of recording because my husband Sunday just was like we got to redo the beams in the kitchen why I don't it had to be done that's it you people have stood in my way long enough and it was with a tone and a kind of insistence I, I, it couldn't be argued for some reason that bee was in his bonnet we're redoing the beams <laughs> we're redoing the lighting we're restaining them it's going to be loud it's going to make the whole house sandy uh sawdusty he put no tarps down. <laughs> oh, well, everyone, we've been uh, doddering on a bit. This is Custler Hustler. Cus this is not that. This is Custler Hustlers. I am your co-host, Nancy. Over there is co-host Topper. Hello. And we are up to chapter 35 of Night Probe. I just have a small disclaimer I'd like to make at the start here. We're not even halfway through the book and we're on episode six, so... It is my hope that we can get through a bunch of chapters today. And based on my notes here, chapter 35 is a great big chapter. The next 10 chapters are very short. Very. And half of them recap what happened in the previous chapter for characters who weren't there. So I'm really hoping you know, we can that uh, is a good sum up. zip through the soggy middle of this book. The beginning of this book is so action-packed and so dense and so many characters and so many moving pieces and so much stuff happening 
And now we're in the middle, and it's just like the Race the Titanic movie where we're just watching bubbles come out of the boat over and over again <laughs> for 20 minutes. <laughs> Holly, you know, old Hollywood did that a lot to us. They built suspense by just using B footage and <laughs> large music, emotional, swelling music. I'm and really noticing that pattern now, yeah. <laughs> this part of the movie is so cheap to make. Oh, we'll go back to... Uh... What was that helicopter show from the 80s? Uh, Airwolf. That's it. That was all be That ah. was one. Yes. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I gave you almost nothing. That was brilliant. Loved that show as a kid. Almost creepy. We're the same person. And we married the same person. Mm -hmm. I once had a neurologist. Years ago, I had to go for a scan. <laughs> and this is a tangent, and I'm sorry. It was like right after high school. I had to do it for a job. I had to get a, a brain scan. The neurologist just absentmindedly said, you know, if you were a man, you'd be so much taller. You'd be a tall man if you were a man. And you'd probably be better at math. And I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck? I just came here to... I'm just getting a medical test. I don't need this editorializing. Is this flirting or insulting? I don't I don't even know what he's trying to get across by he, no, telling he you this. He wasn't either. It was so matter of fact. I, I, no flirting tone whatsoever. <laughs> This was just like, you know, statistically, if you were with the, with these same characteristics, if you were born XY, you'd be this tall and, and testosterone increases math aptitude. And it is Orwellian. It's like 1984. I mean, basically. I think it was 84. It is. It is in the 80s for sure. So it, it was just matter of fact put down because he could, I guess. <laughs> I'd be some like, so you were taller and you're good at math. It, it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you, random doctor. It was insulting, but at the time, but now it's prescient. So I learned a new word from this chapter, this book, uh, grandiloquent. It kind of explains itself, but I've never seen it before. It means pompous. Excessively fancy. It's fancy for the sake of being fancy. And this was how uh, Clive Cussler described the president's chief of staff, Harrison <laughs> Moon the Fourth. He was grandiloquent. We're still meeting new characters, yes. A pompous ass is what we're led to believe. Yeah. All this guy was doing was sitting down at his desk, and he had a name. How dare he? He had a name. He was being snooty somehow, and my notes just say Dirk makes fun of him and then assaults him. Yeah. Dirk Pick goes into this guy's office, basically calls him an asshole, and <laughs> throws him on the ground just because he's there to meet the president. However, this guy is new, and how dare he not know who Dirk Pitt is, which this guy rose the Titanic the year previous. He should have some kind of inkling. He's very bad at his job if he doesn't know who Dirk Pitt is. Even if he didn't, this is the president's chief of staff. He's keeping track of the president's appointments. Dirk Pitt has a meeting with the president. If you have a meeting with the president, by definition, obviously not in modern times, but back then, by definition, you should be important enough to de deserve a little bit of respect. Now, listeners, he threw in that caveat because... <laughs> Yeah, because nowadays you've got the my pillow guy and Kid Rock meeting with the president. The my pillow guy, exactly. I was gonna, I was <laughs> my pillow guy. Uh, turn off the cameras now. I'm gonna talk about machines. If you question the machines, you're not a conspiracy theorist. In the future, if you're listening to this and civilization has collapsed, a former president was one of his main advisors. Was a guy who created a pillow company out of cocaine. <laughs> That is the best definition I've ever heard in my entire life. Thank you. So Turk eventually bulldozes this guy, Harrison, who seems like just a young guy, really just trying to do his job. And he does have to stand between the president and the public. He's over-enthusiastic about it, but he's been humbled. It puts yeah. him in his place and swaggers into the Oval Office. And this is where it gets crazy. <laughs> Here's where it gets crazy. Like I said, I have a lot I'm of notes for this chapter. Here. Here's where it gets crazy. We cover a lot of ground. We have a new president. And we don't get his name. He's just the president. Yes. I noticed that too. He, he's, he wants to... We're in the first hundred days. This is a, a banner time for a new president. You want to get shit done in the first hundred days or else you're kind of seen as a loser or a liar or a waffler. They'll hit you with something if you get nothing done within mm -hmm. the first hundred. So he's trying to make his mark and he tells Dirk, you know this thing you've been working on? Uh... Turns out we could own Canada. <laughs> yep. Uh, he reaches that conclusion after Pitt pulls out Richard Essex's corpse diary and reads out of it. And we learned that Richard Essex kept really good notes. 
And there were three copies of this treaty, one for America, one for Canada, one for the UK. They signed the one in England. They, then they came to Washington and signed it. Then they went to Ottawa and signed it. And then through a series of unfortunate uh, incidents, the copy going to England sank, the copy going to Washington disappeared, and only the one that was still in Canada remained, but it never surfaced. It wasn't in their interest to have it surface, so that at least makes sense. Oh, definitely not. <laughs> that makes sense because this treaty was the UK saying, we are in a pickle. World War I was just ramping up. Uh, their empire is mid-collapse and they're broke. We're going to sell Canada to the US is what they came up with. This is wild. For $1 billion in 1914 money. Billion with a B, uh, which is a, even back then, a, a small sum of money for a whole country, I think. I was going to say that is only $30 billion today, which means Elon Musk could buy six of us. There are no consequences to my actions. Every day is an existential curse. <laughs> Welsh jettification, it's worth it. Yeah. So they, they're casually discussing, you know, we have the pink slip for Canada. What should we do? Should we go find it? And the president's like, actually, turns out we really need it because you found all that oil there. So a new mission has begun. Mm -hmm. At first it was a relic hunt and now we're what now it is a matter of national security, security. The end of chapter 35, the president says, well, I think we should just ignore this whole North American treaty business for now and Pitt leaves. And immediately the president calls the Secretary of State on the holographic communication system. Oh yes. And asks how much America has loaned uh, the UK and then forgiven. And the guy's like, oh, easily a billion dollars, sir. So by the terms of the contract, America has fulfilled the payment plan. And the president is like, excellent. That's like saying, you, I don't have to pay you the money back because you found quarters in my sofa. <laughs> I don't think treaties or any kind of uh, contract works that way. Well, you got to simplify it for the airport novel. Ah, uh, that is legal. I guess. Too. Yeah. Oh, I think you froze. Nope, oh, you're back. Yes, and the president uh, orders his secretary to call up his secretary of state, Douglas Oates, for the holographic call. Mm -hmm. And he wants to shake the books to see if Canada falls out, is what's, what's in my notes. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if we've fulfilled the terms of, of this treaty. And if we have, legally, Canada's ours. All right, you impatient, thirsty gremlins. You win. And you know this would be held up in the courts for centuries. <laughs> yes, there's every once in a while. Um, Let's see where this goes. The people that claimed to, to really own the island of Manhattan come up and lawyers take it pro bono because what if? That has been happening a lot in Canada uh, because... Everybody knows that, you know, most of the native land in Canada and North America was acquired through various treaties. Okay. Which, you know, one side broke. Interesting side note on this float, the paper mache is composed entirely of broken treaties. <laughs> They're good sports. Maybe. And so the First Nations people, you know, they take it to court and say, you, you broke the terms of the treaty, we want our land back. And that's been happening in bits and pieces in the states that I hear about. There was a huge one in Iowa, I want to say. Oh, yeah. Where they got like some huge uh, piece of land back. It might be Kansas because it affected tribal law, murder. A guy who was indigenous man who was tried for murder in the U.S. courts was was freed because he wasn't tried in on the reserve courts. So that was a big hullabaloo. In Vancouver, one of the largest pieces of downtown property so Vancouver being the, one of the most expensive cities in the world, one of the most expensive pieces of land on the water in Vancouver uh, was returned to the Musqueam First Nation in, in Vancouver, and they are, are developing it now with both high rises and affordable housing. That's great. Housing is... So much of BC isn't even treaty land. Like there were no treaties. They just took it. <laughs> so there isn't even a treaty that you could say, you know, they didn't uphold the terms. A lot of BC is unceded, non-treaty land, and the courts are giving it back a bit at a time. Wow, the world is going to shake out into a, a very random place. Yep, it's slow, but I'm all for it. And that was a Tucker ta a, a topper tangent, a topper tangent. He finally had one. <laughs> Yay, not just me. The president has a hot tub meeting in, ch in chapter 36. It's a new hot tub. What are you going to do? JFK's pool. JFK put it in, and then Nixon ah. uh, covered it up. But now he opened it up again. 
so, but they would still heat the room and it was still chlorinated. So there's footage back then of the Nixon press corps just sweating their balls off. <laughs> <laughs> That's real? That's awesome. Yeah. He put in a, a bowling alley somewhere in there too. <laughs> I heard about that. So yeah, chapter 36, uh, they recap Villon shutting off the lights in Eastern US. Yes, yeah, so the president's like, Henry Villon was behind that. And he, this guy wants to break out Quebec and be the, the president? This is gonna, this is not good for the US. The guy mm -hmm. with that volatile on with the, the switch to power for the US is catastrophic. But the president was also wondering, you know, they're going to find this oil reserve that they have. They're going to stumble upon it. But apparently the oil reserve that Pitt found in chapters earlier is, you know, statigraphically, is that the word? Statigraphically uh, trapped. So difficult to find. I'll take over the science, Topper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the oil is secret, even from the Canadians, just because of the angle that they see it on. They'll never find it unless they happen to drill exactly where it is. And Klein's like, why keep it a secret? If we tell them where it is, surely they will favor us and give us good pricing. Because gratitude is not the emotion that's most quickly forgotten. <laughs> Pliny the Elder said that. Gratitude, most quickly forgotten. I didn't make that up. It was Pliny. So if Pliny knew it, Klein should know it. Mm -hmm. Especially when it comes to international politics. You don't think gratitude lasts very long in international politics? Oh. What about oil pricing? That should be... Oh, wait. <laughs> but also, uh, the president's opinion on what's happening in Quebec does a complete 180 now, although that might just be because he has plans for the whole treaty thing, because he tells the CIA to make sure Quebec achieves independence, because a divided Canada is in the best interests of America. But just a couple of chapters ago, they didn't want them to separate, because then they would be controlled by Moscow, and there would be a communist state in the middle of North America. Yes, he's done a, a complete turnaround on this, and Mercer and Klein are worried and confused. Yep. Mercer or Mercier? Mercier. Name like that, I bet he's French-Canadian. Divided loyalties. Chapter 37 opens up at a car auction, auction <laughs> scintillating. Because Clive had not squeezed enough antique cars into this book yet. <laughs> yes, he really got them squozing in here. They go into depth about one automobile. It Trust me, it was old, it was gorgeous, curvy whatever and mm -hmm. the next one comes up and while pitt's gonna just before pitt's gonna bid on this car uh he makes eye contact with the classy broad with nice gams <laughs> and then harrison moon the fourth comes comes in and ruins the mood mm -hmm. and pitt's immediate response is i'm not gay yeah but he <laughs> is uh confident <laughs> the ball imagine the press the president's Chief of Staff sees you, and your first thought is, I'm so hot, he's got to be here for the, <laughs> for me, right? The package? With a name like Harrison Moon IV. My goodness. But he didn't, like, punch him in the face, which for a 1988 fella is very, as we know, pitch progressive. Well, it's up and down. It really depends on the book. I don't know. In 1988, <laughs> people were so hostile towards homosexuals. Mm. It was... uh. Not uncommon to see uh, gay jokes on like a uh, Perfect Strangers, which was a show for children. I remember watching that. Because you're old. Bronson Pinchot. Because we're both old. Yeah. Bronson Pinchot, you knew his name? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> he's been in a lot of Stephen King stuff, and he's been on a lot of Stephen King podcasts I listen to. He's a great. He's a great guy. He has a lot of crazy stories. His voice is amazing. He was amazing. His physical capabilities. He was hilarious. I'm mm -hmm. sure it doesn't hold up at all, but there is a <laughs> Huddy episode that I remember watching when I was seven or eight that cracked me up. I'm not sure that show holds up, but Brunson oh, Pinchot I... went on to do Can't a lot of great imagine. stuff. Can't imagine. But Harry is not there to pick up Dark Pit. He's there on official business. And then we learn the name of the, the classy looking lady who's also going to bid on the car that Pitt wants. Her name is Mrs. O'Leary, and she's, she is from Chicago. Does that mean anything to you? No. Mrs. O'Leary's cow. Okay. That was my first thought, and I thought, there's no way it's something that dumb. Yeah, Mrs. O'Leary's cow knocked over the lantern and started the fire in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just to hearken that she's from Chicago, and that's just... <laughs> okay. We're going to remember she's from Chicago, Mrs. O'Leary. <laughs> that was a joke for Clive. It was. It was like, I'll remember her name, damn it. <laughs> Won't have to put her in the... 
the chart. Yeah, Pitt tells uh, Moon to basically fuck off, or at least wait until he's done buying this car. He buys the car. They have a whole lot of talk about uh, Moon's girlfriend, just to establish that Moon has has a ride out of here. But Pitt's and like, and he's no. heterosexual. Yes, and hetero. Got to have that. But he says, "Okay, Moon, you're with me," and they drive off in whatever was 1926 Jensen which was a neat looking car. It's one of those fancy cars that's like 80% hood and engine and a little spot in the back for the driver. Which in 1988 would fit right in. Oh, probably. The hoods on cars were really extravagant. There was no road safety. And that is where Moon passes on that the president wants Pitt to recover both of the treaties from the St. Lawrence and the Hudson Rivers. And Pitt asks, why does he want them now? And Moon's like, I don't know. Anyway, do you want some money? Yes. Uh, Moon is there to back the money truck up. Yep. And he finally... It's just like the Titanic again. Here's a billion kind of dollars. Go nuts. ingratiates himself with Pitt. Like, listen, I'm just a rube, right? They're not going to tell me what, why. They're not going to tell me the what fors. It's not for me to figure it out. It's for me to tell you what to do so you can do it. And I'm here to provide you with the money. Not, mm -hmm. not the motive. And Pitt's like, oh, finally, you know your place. I'll do it. <laughs> but on one condition, I want to hire Heidi get her back from her commission in the Pacific. Oh, and he wants to clue in Sandecker. He doesn't want to do anything behind oh, Sandecker's yeah. back. And he needs like all of Numa too. So it's good to include Sandecker. Yeah, because all of this is going to be done as a series of Numa projects. So Numa is going to be in, in the St. Lawrence River looking at antiques, which will be split between the American and Canadian museums. And they're going to be in the Hudson River I uh, forget exactly what the cover story was for the Hudson River. Maybe it, it really just was they were looking for the Manhattan Limited, Express Limited, Unlimited Manhattan. Well, they don't need a cover story because that's fully in the U.S. Yeah. The, for the Empress, they need artifacts. It's for just architectural probing. And uh, as they're having this discussion in 1989, they pass an aggressive car that's trying to outmaneuver them. And it's just so he can mention it's an electric mini car. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's so hopeful. Womp womp. Hello, I'm an electric car. I can't go very fast or very far. And if you drive me, people will think you're gay. But now it's now it's time to assemble the team. Yes. Chapter 38 is the Avengers assembling. Because we have Sandecker, we have Pitt, we have Al, we have Rudy Gunn, and we have a very sleep-deprived Heidi who doesn't know why she's there. Oh my god, nobody's told her why she's there. <laughs> she finds out during this meeting, like, wait, my PhD thesis did what? <laughs> You're right, nobody's told her until this point. As far as she knows, she's just being jerked around by the U.S. government and intentionally being sleep-deprived. Yep. She goes from Honolulu to the north side of Canada on the Atlantic. She's exhausted. But then she finds out this is in pursuit of some papers that might be missing and she's like uh she's trying to think about it logically she, she tells the guys the stuff on the ship might be your best bet if the papers are important they're likely wrapped in oil cloth and they could still be in a sealed container due to the nature of how things were packed at the time and also because they know where the empress is the train has never been found and it's 40 cars long and you don't know which car he would have been in when the train went over or how the cars scattered because the train is missing entirely. Yeah, exactly. So at least with the Empress, they basically know where to start. During this meeting, Al is exhausted because <laughs> Pitt briefed him all night. And I took that to mean, good for you, Al. <laughs> <laughs> the romance music plays. <laughs> but they determine after this meeting of the minds between Sandecker, Gunn, uh, Heidi, Al, and Pitt, they have to try for both at once. Mm -hmm. They have all the money. Pitt makes the executive decision. We have all the money. The resources, both at once. We're going to find both at once. And then he has a thousand yard stare in the middle of the meeting. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, he's been doing a lot of zoning out. Like at the end, end of the last chapter, while he's driving along with Moon, he's like stares out into the darkness and talks about, or at least he thinks about how there's this mad scheme hurling him into the crazy unknown. Like he's getting really weird and philosophical. <laughs> the bits we get inside Pitt's head are weird. <laughs> and scrambled. He often just gets a steely look in his eyes and a thousand yard glare and an air of silence overtakes him. And I, what, what happens next? Do you shut the lights off? Do you leave the lights on? 
<laughs> quietly, but meeting adjourned. You aim him at the nearest window and water him occasionally. Oh, that's kind. Yeah. And chapter 39 is... It seemed out of nowhere, but I guess it makes a lot more sense. So General Sims, who is Brian Shaw's boss, Brian Shaw being old man James Bond, yes. goes fishing with the Prime Minister, who has sherry and eel pie. Eel pie? Eel I had pie. ham and veal. Was it veal? Ham and veal. I heard ham and eel. I know eel pie is a British thing that I, I assume we we use to make fun of the Brits, but maybe it was... If you actually have the book and you can see the words ham and veal also hardly makes sense. <laughs> I was hoping it was eel pie. Oh, man. Eel pie makes more sense geographically. Mm-hmm. Because that's, that's a British thing. Ham and veal don't really... That struck me as a not a common meat combo. It's so decadent. It's so pointless because ham's just going to overtake <laughs> the veal. Yep. It's almost American in its pointlessness. But they're also having a vat of sherry, so it's lunch. Yes. No block of cheese for these two. <laughs> yes, but they're, the general is dressed like a regular fisherman guy, and the prime minister is also a casual guy, just out fishing, as they're having this talk. And General Morris assures the president, assures the prime minister that the president is on to the wrong conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. But they're going to put forth an all-out effort to find the North American Treaty. Otherwise, the Commonwealth might collapse. Ah. But why? Britain already agreed to sell Canada because Canada was a net drain on the empire. Well, tides turn. Maybe Canada's turning a profit for them in 1989. I mean, we have all the lumber and all the oil and gas, so yep. Probably. Probably important. I'm sure that had to have been around in the 80s. Like, half the rare earth minerals in the world are in Canada. That's our big export. When I was in school in the 80s, in grade school, Catholic school, again... Miss Rizzo, I hope you're still dead and burning in hell. All we've learned about Canada was we didn't get it. We're... <laughs> My teachers were like manifest destiny from like ocean to ocean. We, and we tried to go up. Didn't work. That's the last we mentioned it. Yay, <laughs> Catholic school. It was cold. Nothing happened. They never burned down our White House. They had fur hats. Ah. The beavers. I do. I remember... Two of my teachers being very angry about it. <laughs> like they were there. <laughs> we could have had Edmonton. <laughs> Which Edmonton is great. I'm not slagging on Edmonton, but why were my two teachers in the 80s so bizarrely hurt <laughs> that Manifest Destiny didn't include everything? America didn't win. Oh my God, that was it. And that meant God lost. Mm-hmm. The end of this chapter is they talk about plans to blow up the Empress if it seems like they're getting close. And they're like, well, what about the train? That's not in Canadian waters. That's in the middle of New York. How do we deal with the train if they find anything? And the Prime Minister is like, then think of something more drastic. Which is leader speak for, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but break the law, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> License to kill. Come on, go. Do I have to spell it out for you? Because I really can. Then I get in trouble. The Vinny the Chin Gigante approach to. <laughs> you said that name with such authority. I knew him. Uh huh. Well, not well, but like he was a man of the neighborhood. Don't make you mad. Got it. He was crazy as far as I knew. Yeah, we're finally zipping through these chapters, and now we're in part four. And part four is, isn't even halfway through the book. I don't know how many parts are in this book. How is it not halfway through? Part four is more than halfway through the book okay. here. Maybe around halfway, but Clive is going mad with power with this book. Sir, I'm afraid you've gone mad with power. Of course I have. You ever tried going mad without power? It's boring. No one listens to you. Two-thirds. Yes, Clive has gone mad. You can put a period right there. There's no way that's two-thirds, because this is the six-hour mark of a 12-hour audiobook. Your guy just got slow. He's reading Mr. The, Brick slows it down. The final <laughs> few chapters <laughs> like this. Part 4. The Empress of Ireland. May 1989. Ottawa, Canada. Yes, and Henry, Villon, and Shaw are together. Yeah, what the hell? My first... Well, for this part, I have two notes. One, how do they know each other? And two, does Villon know that he's been cuck-dumped by Foss Gly? Oh, no, he doesn't. I'm assuming he doesn't. That, there's a term for that? Like, I don't know if there's a term. That? 
I just made Dreamark, that. Up. Dreamark. <laughs> I just made that up. Well, that's the name of the episode. Crap. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna put this podcast into an envelope and mail it to yourself. <laughs> If you have a better term for what Foscolide did to him the last time we there saw him. There is no better term. That is perfection. But I'll I didn't think them. it was in the vernacular. And now it is. We create <laughs> words on this podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like Shakespeare. <laughs> Henry Villan has been cut dumped unwittingly. <laughs> but he's meeting with James Bond, geriatric Shaw. And Shaw's like, uh, I need a boat and five men to destroy the uh, Empress of Ireland before Pitt gets to it. And Villan's like, I'm going to pair you up with this guy. He's fantastic. His name is Fosgly, period. Dun, dun, dun. Inspector Fosgly. He's a Mountie. Oh, you know, I didn't even, I thought that was like a term of endearment. When I read it, it didn't occur to me that that was like a, oh yeah, it's a thing. He's mounted on a horse. I just like, oh, he's a dude. <laughs> no, the, the Mounties are our federal police. That's the equivalent of the FBI. That's the equivalent of the FBI? That I did not know. Thank you. That is interesting. Mounties are are federal agents. I just thought they were guys with horses. <laughs> They're that too. <laughs> so this, I'm taking away here. Volan knows nothing. And Gly is uh, skating in his wake. At this point, I assume Fosgly is in charge of everything that happens. And Volan is just like holding on for dear life as his plans fall apart. Every time I read his name, it sounds like a new type of disease. Oh, <laughs> in the area all have to be cut down. There's a case of Fosgly running around. Ask your doctor if Fosgly is right for you. If you have Fosgly, you are not eligible to take Sinestra. <laughs> okay, chapter 41. Al is working tons of, pro tons of problems and delays out on his end of the project. He just gets delayed, delayed, delayed. So he's five days behind schedule, and he's just uh, going through the, the motions of the day today with uh, Captain Glenn Chase. They finally have everything working, and they have a uh, a mini sub that's remote controlled. Yep. So it's not tethered, which is really high tech. And they're going to get underway finally and see what's in the Empress of Ireland. And they're about to get spooked. Oh no, Al's Al's. I was going to say guy. they're on the Hudson, so they're the train guy. They're about to get spooked anyway. They're about to get spooked because my notes just say they're attacked by a ghost train. Yes, they hear a whistle, and Al is like a working dog. He knows. Not only where the whistle is coming from, when you're he hearing a whistle in a wooded area, it is not necessarily easy to determine the direction, especially in a mountainous area like New York. It doesn't seem mountainous. To you guys on the West Coast, it's hilly. <laughs> you um, think you have mountains. That's adorable. I know, but we do have weird sound dampeners that we call hills. Yeah, true. And the whistle is getting louder and louder, and Al's like, that's got to be a mile away. That's closer than a mile away. He's like Bloodhound. Good for Al. I didn't know his hearing was that keen. And he also knows that it wouldn't be a modern battery train or a diesel train. He knows that it has to be a coal train, a steam train, because it's a steam whistle, not a regular whistle. What level of um, military do you think you have to be to go through the whistle training? <laughs> I think that's just somebody who has a lot of toy trains at home and will go off for extended periods of time about the difference between the 1926 and the 1927 uh, <laughs> steam locomotives. In this chapter of functioning autism. But then there's a train, and it's like it, it's on the hill above them, and then it seems like it's coming off the hill towards them, and then it disappears, and the train's gone. They both see it. They're both terrified. Mm -hmm. It's Is it Folly Odu? Is it Madness of Two? No. Both of these men are convinced they saw a ghost train and it just dematerialized. And just because of how often they brought it up in this book, I'm hoping it's another holograph because the president has the holographic machine that he used to talk with his secretary of state. And the way they describe it, like the dude appears in a chair in the Oval Office. So mm -hmm. it's exactly what they had in Star Wars for the emperor to talk to people. I imagine it's better. Like you can't see through them. Like it's opaque. Like they're in the room. Mm-hmm. Because it is very deliciously detailed as a holographic photo. It's not the video call of today where you're staring at your phone and you see grandma's ear because she's holding the phone <laughs> like a normal person holds the phone. Move the phone away, grandma. <laughs> this is a full holographic Princess Leia, but you don't see through her. It's like she's in the room. It's like she's got mass. It's very <laughs> realistic. And I think you're right. I think it's the president behind everything because he's a new guy. <laughs> don't trust the new guy. He's a commie. I figured it out. 
teamwork. We did it. All right. So that's yeah. They uh, after seeing the uh, the ghost train, those two have a good sit down. They were freaked out. And for <laughs> chapter forty two, Heidi informs Pitt of the location of of the cabin Shields was likely in. And this is good, and it's bad. She's like, you know that spot where the boat was hit by the other boat? Right here. Right here on the algae. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they fi- they figured that Harvey Shields was traveling like undercover, so he wasn't in like a fancy stateroom. He was traveling with the regular people. So he was on B deck, which I guess is like just above storage. So he was he's where they got hit at the waterline. He's where they would have gotten flooded. And since that's where the boat took on water, it tipped over in that direction and sank. So his room is also face down in the mud. Yes, the the boat is tilted on the side that they need to get to. <laughs> also, uh, my notes say Clive talks about Pitt's boat that he's using for this excursion, like he's sexually attracted to it. The ocean venturer gets a lot of lurid descriptions. It's a, it's a long languid description of the boat. Clive was sweating over this boat. I, you know, I love enthusiasm. The guy has enthusiasm. (laughs) There's enthusiasm for the cars, and then there's this. (laughs) Uh Ah, chapter 43, the president visits Sandecker for an update, and we get an update too. Sappho 1 is back. What, really? Yeah, Sappho 1 is back in chapter 43. Did I miss that? Goddamn. All right. I missed the part about the Sappho. Uh, I enjoyed the part that they're talking about the cool underwater, like, robot suits, so yes, they, they call them need... M suits. J I M. So they don't need to decompress. Yes, they're underwater mech suits that weigh just loads of. If you're wearing them outside of the water, you can't move. But in the water, it they say it just weighs sixty pounds. They weigh six hundred pounds out of the water. But it, it's like wearing a heavy backpack when you're in the water. Not a big mm-hmm. deal. And uh, uh, th- that's one of the tools they have in their basket. They also have a pressurized tank that men could live in. And just decompress only once. They're welding a base onto the side of the Empress of Ireland. That sounded terrifying. Base camp. To be welded into a tube so you don't have to do... De- <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and then there's other people. We have to do this amongst others. How big is this money truck? Is there a bar on board? I- it's fine. Oh, sure. But they also talk about uh, this book's magic MacGuffin substance. In Raise the Titanic, we had wet steel... In this book, we have pyroxone. Which sounds like C4. Which is like thermite, but it works underwater. And they're just going to melt their way through the hull all the way down, straight line down into where they hope Harry Shields has the treaty. Yes, they they call it pyroxone, and it's a putty substance. Magic liquid underwater fire. And this is what Sandecker relates to the president, all of these tools that they have in place to complete the mission. And then Sandecker says, what are we doing this for? <laughs> And presidents like, oh, crazy reasons, secret Nothing. crazy reasons. <laughs> it's a zany scheme. It's fine. Do you like funding? If you like funding, shut up. <laughs> yes, if you like funding, shut up. Hold on, just one second. All right, my teenager needs a ride. Can I put you on pause and come back? Yeah, sure, if you want. Okay, I'll be as fast as I can. Okay. <laughs> caught behind every school bus. <laughs> I'm very sorry about that. That's all right. We'll bash out a couple of chapters and then I have to go back to work. <laughs> okay. Hopefully you got some work done in the... Or not. Maybe you we're just doing all the crack cocaine and heroin in the downtime. <laughs> as you do. Only when you're not looking. Sorry to fly off the handle like that. And now we're into chapter 44 and weird shit starts happening. Yes. Uh, they've got the, the wireless remote control vessel in the Empress of Ireland. Yeah, the the RSV, the remote submersible remote submersible vehicle. And I was only slightly annoyed that Heidi, who is a naval commander, is the one who has to ask how it works so Dirk can explain it to the reader. Well, if she doesn't have a Y chromosome, how could she understand? <laughs> it's just going to fall right out of her head. If only she were taller, she would be mathematically inclined and she could understand how, <laughs> yes. how wires control things. You know, I was things. thinking about that in the right home. I think that was the, I think he just low-key hated women and he was just throwing that in. <laughs> you know, if you had the right genes, he'd be taller and good at math. Oh, he said, no, no, just if I had, just, I had the right genes. Unfortunately, I was a woman. Oh, they run the wrong chromosome. Yeah. So anyway, they're, uh, they've got this little uh, RC sub 
in the sunken ship yep. and it sees a ghost. It does. And that was a really weird description because it seemed like they just found a body. Yes. I thought that they just bumped into a, a skeleton. Yeah. But the they apparently all see this apparition. It scares the bejesus, bejesus out of all of them. Uh, guy Doug Hoax looks like death. He looks like he's seen mortality walking and it's mm -hmm. coming for him. He's very spooked. Yeah, so they, they back the RSV up and the ghost is chasing it now. And there appears to be two of them or one pops out? Yeah, because they want to get the RSV to uh, do a 180 and just sort of get out of there. And while they're doing that, there's one behind it. There's one behind it and it gets bumped. So this thing is not just spectral, it's physical. Everybody's freaking out. Everybody can't believe it. There's like, I'm sure there's people fainting just off screen, but Pitt has iron self-control. Yes, he, his thousand yard stare is being put to good use now. He's thinking through the situation. And over here, I'm like, it's a remote, it's an RC car. The ghosts have your <laughs> RC, at the, at the worst, the beings from another spectral dimension just stole your toy. Yes. It's spooky, but it's not scary. It's a very expensive RC car, but yeah. Oh, that makes it scarier. You know, if somebody like, took my car car, I'd be very upset. Also, that was all of chapter 44. We're now on chapter 45. <laughs> Most of chapter 44 was a long shot of, of the Empress with bubbles coming out of it, just like Grace the Titanic. Oh, no, no. There's a, there's a spot at the end there. The ghosts go up, 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 up with the... Uh... That's in chapter 45. That's the... Oh, my... It's a weird spot to end the chapter, but chapter 45 is where Pitt's like, okay... Ram the ghost. That's why. This and is everyone's why... freaking out. <laughs> yes. I have no chapter 45. Oh, really? No. Yes. Oh, really. Okay. <laughs> well, there you go. Your book's doing that again. <laughs> okay. So for me, now we're in chapter 45 where Pitt says Ram the ghost. Yes. <laughs> Pitt says Ram the ghost. And then they, they're like, oh, they, these are... Uh, somehow he determines these are bad guys. And he's like, can we power down and still have the camera on? Or can you make the underwater device look like it's out of juice and not operational? Yeah. And Doug's like, I'm on it. And thank you, Pitt, for being here, you masculine god, to <laughs> steer us through this spooky phenomenon. I had to write down the line that everybody was in awe of Pitt's command and raw self-control. Yes, complete. He's not afraid of ghosts. Of no ghosts. He's not afraid of ghosts. <laughs> This doesn't seem like a situation where you need the man with the iron self-control to deal with, uh, hey, there's some guys dressed as ghosts stealing our submarine. Some guys are Scooby doing it. Yeah. <laughs> a fathom but, under. But he's already attacked a ghost train earlier in the book, so he's gotten it out of his system. Oh, did he shoot the ghost train? I forget. Uh, no, but he, he ran towards it. Oh, they, okay. I can't go left. I can't go right. Face first. I'm surprised he didn't shoot it. It's almost an American. <laughs> He didn't have his silenced gun at that time. <laughs> so uh, I have no chapter 45. I just have the... Heidi is the one who actually saw a ghost because when the yep. spectral apparitions take their stolen um, RC device up, 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 and they, they notice the camera's on, and it's getting lighter and lighter. One of them removes their masks, their diving masks, and it's Shaw. It's old man James Bond and Heidi... Now Heidi is shook. She thought she was afraid before when she saw the ghost. She mm -hmm. saw a next date. The submersible reaches the surface. Uh, it looks like it's being hauled onto a fishing ship. Because when they were doing the scene setting earlier, when Dirk Pitt's boat, I don't know what the heck was it called, the Ocean Venturer was set up over the Empress. There's a bunch of little fishing trawlers going up and down the St. Lawrence. So as soon as Dirk sees that it's being hauled onto a fishing boat, he runs up on the surface and gets out his binoculars and starts scanning the fishing boats and there's five of them they all just look like regular fishing boats he can't tell which one it was and i guess there was no way from the angle to determine what direction the boat was in mm -hmm. so no they're expensive i i believe they said it was two hundred thousand dollars their toy is gone yep and heidi's having some major <laughs> ire's remorse on the shaw date there he heads back downstairs. That's when where Heidi's having her freak out. But also, so is Brian. Sh Brian Shaw's having the freak out because they can't hear anything over the camera. Because why would you have a, a microphone on an RSV like that? It looks like Brian Shaw is is mad at the other divers and calling them idiots for stealing well, the submarine. <laughs> when, yes, 
because he realizes his it was fair. There was a camera on it. Yeah. And he was like, "Oh, the guys, the camera was still on. You <laughs> dopes. You guys are really bad at that." And they're like, "Oh, we didn't take our mask off, Shaw, and that's kind of a you problem now." <laughs> that too. <laughs> and then um, Shaw and Gly have figured out that the RSV, which is always uh, was jarring to read, because my mind was like RSV, the disease. An SVU, the <laughs> Law and Order thing. <laughs> yeah, we've just had a you know a long nasty bout of remote submersible vehicle in this house. So I'm right I'm there with you. Truly sorry. That's that's a month. <laughs> Oof. And then you know sexual assault unit too. It's, there's all kinds of emotions in this SVU thing. I drive one of those. <laughs> so now the U.S. knows. So Shaw's upset because the U.S. knows that Britain knows that you. The U.S. knows that Britain knows that the U.S. knows, or I know, it's something like that. They're all upset that everybody knows everything now. Yeah, but Shaw wouldn't know that America knows that Britain knows, because Shaw can't assume that anybody on that boat knows who he is, unless he also knows that Heidi is part of Pitt's crew. But we learned he was so burned as when he was a secret James Bond dude, that his image is likely to be, if it's transmitted at all, he's likely to be ID'd. Oh, ah, okay. Good point. I do not have many notes for the next chapter because that was as far as I got. Oh, okay. Let's stop there then. There was a scene in, there were White Walkers, not Hobbits, but... <laughs> Game of Thrones? It was on HBO. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> there was a scene where two people were discussing, you know, that I know, that you know. <laughs> that... Yes. This is what that felt like. I love those scenes. Yes, it was the... The, the tall eunuch guy and the Tyronian. Uh, that was Varys and Tyrion. Yes. Very good. <laughs> and the, so earlier today, listeners, Topper sent me a photo of him, not really of him, of the likeness of him, like an isolate. <laughs> I can't be identified. No, you cannot. <laughs> it could have been anybody's eyes. I'm not sure it was you. So you an image of a ski mask. On a man, presumably, maybe it was Sopper, covered in ice, <laughs> walking the dog. That's the main issue of having um, a mask over your mouth like that when you're walking the dog. Uh, listeners, it was minus 30 here this morning. So every breath out, you just get a bit more ice everywhere. <laughs> so yeah. my hood was covered in ice, the area around my eyes, my eyelashes are covered in ice. Your neighbor's a white walker, you live <laughs> a, along the wall. We're very pale. Well, that you are. Me too. But <laughs> that's just happenstance. That's because there's no diversity on the internet. That's just what <laughs> And that's a good place to leave it. I, again, I'm sorry for the delay in the middle there. That's all right. We will pick this up next week. Yes, and hopefully I find no more dead people here in my attic. But yeah. can't promise that. I can't top <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. This has been Custler Hustlers. Your hosts have been Topper and Nancy. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at Custler Hustlers.